nanohub.org. Okay, let's begin the uh, second half of our first day of sessions for device characterization. Um, I really enjoyed the interaction this morning. There were some very, very good questions. Um, feel free to do that more. I think, uh, you know, we're videotaping this. I think those same questions that you have would be the same questions somebody watching an archived copy of this would have. So I think those are very, very useful, very good. We're now going to talk about speed and timing considerations. And there, there's two main reasons why we look at speed and timing. One is noise. Do we need to, what do we need to do to manage the noise in our measurement? And the second is uh, making sure that we're settled. Now there's a third a little bit more subtle and that is what I call the attention span factor. So if you press the run button on a measurement and you know that measurement's going to take three minutes, odds are you're going to get up and walk out of the room and get a cup of coffee, you're going to get distracted, you're probably not going to get back for 10 or 15 minutes and then you're going to press it again and you're going to get distracted again. It's not very productive, but if that measurement comes back to you in 15 seconds, it gives you immediate feedback and you can continue to work and think and, and move ahead in your characterization. So, you know, speed in terms of throughput also is, is relevant to how much work you can actually get done. <clears throat> now, I had actually put together a really nice set of slides on noise on the three or four different uh, sort of noise sources in the system. Uh, that slide disappeared last night at 9.30 at night. I really don't know where it went. So, um, you know, we can talk a little bit about noise if you like. But, uh, you know, the factors I want to start with are factors that impact measurement time. So we have factors that are internal to our instrumentation. In this case, the, uh, the model 4200 parameter analyzer. And we have factors that are external to it, that are device related factors. So our internal factors are the speed factors that we see in our timing windows, our A to D converters, our filter factors, our delay factors, our current measurements and source range. The current range is a big factor in how fast we can make a measurement, how fast we can settle. Uh, the number of data points in the sweep or the number of resources, the number of SMUs that are simultaneously measuring might impact how fast we can measure. External factors include things like the resistance or capacitance of the device that we're testing, uh, the cables, whether they're guarded versus unguarded, and we'll describe what that means, as well as test fixtures, probers, and switch matrices. <coughs> So in the 4200, we have what we call the timing window. And this is where almost all of the timing takes place in the interactive test module. You recall from this morning's session, we also have user test modules. And the timing in the user test module is handled by whoever wrote the code for that. Right? But in the interactive test module, we have a whole window set aside just for managing timing. And in particular, we came up with a set of concepts based on some experience that we call the fast, normal, and quiet timing. So it works like this. In normal timing, which is the default timing, this works for most cases. It's a nice compromise between speed and noise. It allows enough settling time for most cases. In some cases, it might take a little extra time, but normal, almost always works. If timing is not an issue for you, just use normal. Leave it on normal. Now we also have fast speed. Now what fast is, is intended to get your results faster so that you're not as bored or distracted, or it's intended to get the results faster because you have a time dependent phenomena in your sample that you want to look at. And then we have what we call the quiet speed. Obviously, this is a slower speed intended to lower the noise and give more settling time. It takes more time. So we use the concepts of fast, normal, and quiet. Um, these, I, I was surprised to find when we laid out this software, nobody had used these concepts before in instrumentation. They all talk about power line cycles and filtering and averaging and things like that, you know, but this is a more general concept. Now our 4200 
actually has a set of tables built into the firmware into the firmware of the source measure units. And that set of tables includes what we call delay factors and um, filter factors. So the 4200 through design and testing, we've built in the optimum speeds and the optimum delays and the optimum times necessary to get good results. And so if you want to do something to the 4200, you do that based on factors compared to those original tables. Now, if you add a delay factor, what this really is, is a multiplier on the internal delay table. If the internal delay was 20 milliseconds for some particular set of settings, and you set a delay factor of two, that would be two times the internal table of 20 milliseconds. The delay tables inside are dependent on a variety of settings, uh, current range is the biggest driver. So by using a concept of a delay factor, you're saying, I want two times the delay because something makes me think I need two times the delay. And that two times the delay will apply whether I'm at a 10 millisecond range or a 300 millisecond range. Okay, so that 2x applies to the entire table. Now the filter factor was a new concept that, that I developed um, 10 years ago because I, I queried a lot of people. And, and I'll query you, I'll give you a chance here. <clears throat> so if you have an instrument, and this instrument allows you to do averaging to reduce noise. Everybody knows averaging reduces noise, right? You take more samples, you can get your noise down. <clears throat> so if I asked you, well, I want to reduce the noise by a factor of two. How much averaging do I need to do to reduce the noise by a factor of two? It's actually, believe it or not, I rarely get an answer to that. It's a fundamental thing. It's taught in elect Electrical Engineering 101, but nobody ever remem remembers it. Twice? <laughs> so in general, there's different kinds of noise, but in general, noise is considered, when we talk about this, we talk about white noise, okay? And white noise is reduced by, is proportional to the square of the sampling time. So if I want to reduce the noise by a factor of two, I have to look at the signal by a factor of four. So I need four times more time. So if my average was, if my average was, well, it doesn't matter what the average was. If I took one sample and I wanted to reduce the noise by two, I would have to take four averages to reduce the noise by a factor of two. Well, nobody remembers that. They just know I'm going to throw some averaging on there and I'm going to get the noise down. So I completely threw that whole concept out and I said filter factor is a noise reduction factor. So I have a set of tables in the instrument that, that knows how long to look at the signal to give a really good measurement, whether it's voltage or current. And that varies based on range and other factors. So if I want to reduce the noise by a factor of two, I put two into filter factor. Basically what it does is it gives me four times longer integration on the signal. So filter factor in this case is a noise reduction factor. Okay. Now a couple of other settings. We have hold time, sweep delay, and interval. Okay. Now. These are settling time constants that are built into the system to allow the system to settle and to allow the device to settle. Now, a parameter analyzer in general has been perceived as an instrument that when I press the button, it gives me a good set of data. Most people are not parameter analyzer experts. They're experts in physics or oxides or or doping or silicon carbide or some other material, they're not at measurement experts. But they do know the data they want and they want the data to be good. So the system has been tuned to generally compensate for the variety of probe stations, cables, and the system itself. When you hit the run button, it pretty much gives you good data, but not always. So if you want to tune that data, you can come in and tune the hold time, the sweep delay, and the interval. Hold time is that initial time when the instrument first starts up. In some cases, you may have a test, for example, that starts at 
30 volts instead of zero volts. So there's that big 30 volt slew at the beginning. Everything in the system, your device, the cables, everything has to settle to that 30 volts. We might need an extra piece of time there at the beginning of a test. So hold time is right at the beginning of a test only. Sweep delay is the delay from point to point. You recall from this morning's session that we have a source delay measure cycle where we have a certain amount of time where we turn on the source, certain amount of time that we wait for things to settle, and then a certain amount of time it takes to measure things. Well, that, that delay that's built into the instrument can be extended by this sweep delay. That's a delay at every point of the sweep. Okay. And then the interval actually applies to the sampling measurement. Remember, we have two types of measurements. We have a sweeping measurement where we're changing the source between every measurement. We have a sampling measurement where the source remains constant, but we're taking multiple readings with time. So this interval defines that time. <clears throat> Lastly, we have something here that we call the A to D converter integration time. How do I describe this? So an A to D converter takes a look at a, at a analog signal and it looks at it for a discrete amount of time and it converts it to a digital signal. There's a lot of different A to D converter technologies out there. This particular instrument, because we want at least 24 bits and very low noise, we went with a custom design integrating, it's called a dual, dual slope charge balance integrating A to D converter. That means the A to D converter itself can look at the signal for a programmable amount of time. The longer we look at the signal, the more digits of resolution we get and the lower our noise is. <clears throat> now the A to D converter times, which are also known as the measurement window, um, are all set in firmware and in software and they're automatic and in most cases you never need to mess with them. Okay, but we give you the option of actually going, being able to go in and program the A to D converter times that you want, should you want to do that. So how does external noise impact my measurement? Well, one of the biggest sources of noise is the 60 hertz line cycle that we get. We got 60 hertz uh, power coming out of the wall, powering the instrument. We've got 60 hertz radiating from every one of these lights or more. We've got 60 hertz coming from motors and, and, and all sorts of sources, even from the wiring in the walls. We've got 60 hertz all over this room. Well, if I have a signal that I measure in one millisecond, if I grab that signal with 60 hertz noise on it right here at, line, at the crossing point, I'm going to get one reading. If I grab it here at the peak point, I'm going to get a different reading. So, so by having 60 hertz everywhere, when I'm trying to get really low level measurements, but I have a fast signal like a millisecond, I'm going to actually be riding on top of whatever that 60 hertz noise is. <clears throat> so one way that I get around that, there's a couple ways to get around it. The, the, the first way that people tried was they tried synchronizing the measurement to the line. In other words, every time the line crosses zero, I'll make a measurement. And, and that's, that's not a bad idea, really. I mean, it gets you a kind of a measurement at kind of a peak or a, a minimum point, right? However, I have to wait for the next zero crossing. I might as well just look at the whole signal the whole time. So this is where we came up with the concept of what we call power line cycle. So it really doesn't matter where I start the measurement as long as I integrate it over an entire power line cycle known as one PLC, the noise from that 60 hertz integrates out. It becomes zero. <clears throat> so the concept of power line cycles is really a very common concept, particularly in precision instrumentation. So one power line cycle means that I integrate over one complete cycle of the power line. Two power line cycles means I do it twice. Okay. If you look at a typical sub-picoamp instrument like this one here, 
Oftentimes we're up at 10 power line cycles or even 50 or 100 power line cycles of integration time in order to get the noise down so we can make the measurement. <clears throat> so when we talk about controlling the A to D converter, we give you the option of controlling the number of power line cycles and that can be a fraction. It could be 0 0.01 power line cycles. Well, in the United States, 60 hertz uh, line cycle 16.6 .6 milliseconds, 0 0.01 would be 1.6, 160 microseconds of integration time at 0 0.01 line cycle. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to settling time. Settling time is the time that it takes a measurement to stabilize after something in the system has changed. In our case, it's usually us changing the voltage or the current on our sample. But more recently, as we've been looking at memristors and other new technologies, it's the device itself radically changing its resistance value, and we have to respond to that. Okay. So settling time is how fast does the system reach a known state? Now, factors that uh, impact the settling time includes the instrumentation itself. In particular, with a DC instrument, low current ranges take a long time to settle. Low current ranges are slow. As you go up in range, they go faster. So low current ranges take a long time to settle. Turns out low voltage ranges aren't the same for some very interesting technical reason, but low current ranges are the biggest <clears throat> uh, factor in settling speed. <clears throat> the other big factor is cabling, test fixtures, switch matrices, and probe stations. One of the things that Keithley did when we designed this instrument is we said, this instrument is intended as a semiconductor research tool, which means the majority of the time it's got to be cabled to a probe station. It's got to go through probe needles and manipulators and probe cards and switch matrices and cables. So, so I'm going to test a, a MOSFET or a device which is being designed to work with less than one micrometer of parasitic test lead on it but I'm going to hang two meters of cable on it and put an instrument at the end of it and try and test that device. It's not a trivial task. It's a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, we, we often will see these devices that, uh, that you guys are designing and testing begin to oscillate and do strange things when we hang two meters of cable on the device. The device itself has a certain resistance and capacitance. And so there's going to be some settling time issues in the device itself. Now it's particularly interesting with a DC instrument. In general, we consider a DC measurement as a, a measurement that has reached a quasi-static or an equilibrium condition. By definition, that's DC. But the truth is we have many of the devices and materials that we work with have very long time constants, time constants in the hundreds of milliseconds or seconds or even in the case, some cases, days. Okay. Um, and so, you know, the concept of DC takes on a whole new meaning. So you need to be aware of the timing of your DC instrument to know, am I actually measuring my device in a period where the device is not in equilibrium? The classic case was uh, the interface traps in uh, the MOS structure, MIS structure. Interface traps have varying response rates depending on a variety of factors. I heard interface traps that would respond in a few microseconds and I had interface traps that wouldn't respond for uh, hundreds of milliseconds or even a second. So if you want to get all your trap information, you have to make sure that whatever you're measuring waits long enough that all the traps have a chance to respond. So settling time is a result of an RC time constant. That RC time constant could be instrument, cables, or device, or some phenomena in the device that we're looking at. For example, if we had a 10 picofarad shunt capacitor. By the way, 
uh, you know, you know, 10 picofarads is really little. <laughs> That's not very much capacitance. Sometimes we deal with, we're used to dealing with wafers and structures that are a micron and submicron in size, right? But when you're talking about things that have cables that are two meters long and probe stations with arms that humans can interact with, 10 picofarads is is an extremely tiny amount of capacitance to manage from a test system perspective. So imagine we had 10 picofarads of shunt and we had a series resistance of a teraohm. Teraohm is not difficult actually to achieve at a, uh, at a wafer level. So then our time constants, 10 picofarads at a teraohm, a settling time of 50 seconds would be re required to reach 1% of the final value. Okay. Now, the way that we reduce this parasitic capacitance is by using some tricky techniques, of the most important of which is guarding, and we'll talk about how guarding works in a minute. So, how do we reduce test time in our system? Well, first of all, we can use a fixed measurement range. Whenever the instrument has to make a decision on the range, what it has to do is it has to step to where it wants to go, it has to take a look, do an A to D conversion, pass that through its digital engine, make a decision, was I on the right range? I'm not on the right range, I have to then go through the digital process of changing the range, waiting for it to settle again and making another measurement. So the act of auto ranging, while it makes it really convenient for you to take your data, is actually a very time consuming thing and makes the timing of your data quite unpredictable. An instrument might sit for hundreds of milliseconds in a particular voltage waiting for the range to settle to, before it makes a decision. Maybe in your test you don't want it to sit for 100 milliseconds there. So if you used a fixed range, the instrument knows in advance where it wants to be and it can do things much faster. If auto ranging is unavoidable, in other words, if you have a transistor that crosses many orders of magnitude, um, you may need several different ranges. Try to use what we call limited auto ranging. That says, remember, the lower we go in current range, the slower the instrument goes. So if, if I'm saying I'm happy with data at, at 100 picoamp level, use a limited auto range 100 picoamp. Don't let the instrument go lower than that. That will greatly speed things up. Use less points in the sweep. A very common trick for people that are new to measurements is they say, well, if 40 points in the sweep are good, 80 points are better. I'll get more resolution on my data. Uh, maybe more resolution doesn't actually bring you any information and it takes twice as long to acquire the data. You can optimize the speed settings. Remember we talked about fast, normal, quiet, and we talked about hold time and settling time. Now you can actually go in and reduce hold time and settling time to zero. You can go in and turn off the automatic A to D converter and set the A to D converter as fast as it can go and you can actually get the instrument to move much faster than it's actually capable of doing. Now you can get some qualitative results on your sample, but it's really difficult to deconvolve from your results. Is it measurement artifact or is it uh, is device artifact. So you really have to think through why am I trying to get this very fast measurement on my device and understand if, uh, if, if just seeing the response of the device is worth the fact that you can't pull out the response of the instrument. And then tracks, cables, and guarding greatly improves your, your measurement speed. <clears throat> so the timing tab um, again, we select the speed mode as fast, normal, quiet, or custom. If we use custom, that gives us very fine control of the A to D converter. We can precisely tell the A to D converter exactly what we want it to do. Most people just use normal. We can configure the delay factor and the filter factor. We can add delay, sweep, and hold time. And I wanted to mention real briefly this SMU power on sequence. In some devices, they're sensitive to which voltage comes up first. 
the classic case is what they call the parasitic SCR in a MOSFET. Um, it's, it's a PNPN junction that, that can show up in a MOSFET. If you don't power it up in the right order, it'll latch on and you'll short things out. So you want to power up your most negative things first. So this power up sequence says, this is the order I want the SMUs to power up. Now, if you don't set a sequence, they all power up at the same time, right? Which could be hundreds of microseconds or a millisecond apart from each other. Plenty of time to cause latch up. Two other very important little buttons here. One is timestamp. The source measured units, remember, run independent of Windows. They're off running, not talking to Windows, just handing data to Windows. So they have a built-in watchdog timer. If you turn the timestamp on, that data is handed back into your data sheet. There is no time penalty. I'm not quite sure why we even have timestamp as an option here. It should just be turned on all the time. I automatically turn it on all the time. I always want to know how fast my measurements are taking. I want to be able to look at time. It's a critical parameter to me. So, but. You do have a button to disable it if you want to try to manage your data. And finally, we have another little button here called Disable Outputs at Completion. We created this as a standby condition for the instrument. Um, in some cases, when you're doing reliability testing, or maybe you have a device which is particularly sensitive or slow settling, at the end of the test, you want to leave the device under bias. All right, that's what this will allow you to do. If you disable outputs at completion, which is the default condition, it shuts all the voltage sources off at the end of the test. Okay, but if you if you check this checkbox, it leaves the voltage source on at the last voltage that it was at. Now remember, the front panel of the instrument has that bright blue LED that whenever it's lit, there's voltage coming out. So it's, you know, it's, it's, we used to be able to say there's only voltage coming out when you're executing a test. We can't say that anymore since we added this standby mode. Whenever the blue light is on, there is voltage coming out of the instrument and you do need to be careful about touching things, lifting probes, setting probes down, that type of thing. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the delay factor setting. So remember that system has built-in delays and the delay factor is a direct multiplier on those delays. So if we're in normal mode, our, deflay, our delay factor is one. That means one times whatever delay is in the, my table, okay? If I go to the fast mode, I'm basically multiplying the table by 0.7. It's 30% faster. What it's saying is, um, I don't need to wait as much settling time as you have allowed in the system. Remember, we in general tune the system for a broad range of installations and devices. So in many cases, fast is plenty. If I go to quiet, it's 30% longer. Basically says, my cables or my test fixture, my probes or my device requires further settling time. Another way to look at quiet is to say, um, I want my noise to be lower. So I'm, when I select quiet, I want my A to D converter to run longer and it will. But because I'm on an exponential, almost every settling thing is an exponential curve, I'm going to give that exponential curve more time to get down to the bottom of the curve. Actually, an exponential curve never reaches the bottom, but. And then finally, we have the custom setting, which allows us to select anything from zero, which says disable the internal delays, all the way up to a hundred. That's an awful lot of delay. Let me think. So on the one picoamp range, a typical delay is in the neighborhood of, I think, five seconds per point. So if you actually selected a custom delay of 100, that'd be 100 times five, that'd be 500 seconds per data point. You're pushing, what, nine minutes, eight minutes. Eight minutes for each data point 
to appear. <laughs> you, you really, I'm not, I'm not sure why you would do that, you know, but, you know, it's there. Our next setting is what we call the filter factor. So you remember the filter factor is actually a noise reduction factor. So if you chose a filter factor of normal that says, what does Keithley consider to be a normal amount of noise in this measurement? You know, we sort of define that by the specifications. Um, that's our normal amount of noise. So if I run it normal, I get a normal amount of noise. But if I run it fast, I'm actually saying, I want my noise to be 0.2, or another way to say it is, I want the noise, to, I'm allow, willing to allow the noise to be five times higher. I'm allowing five times more noise. Now, remember the relationship between noise and time. It's a squared relationship. So five times more noise, only buys me the square root of five in time. Okay. So if I go to quiet, what I'm saying is I want three times less noise. My noise will be reduced by a factor of three. That takes nine times more time. So if my measurement was one line cycle before, one PLC, it now becomes nine PLC. That's all taken care of in the software and the firmware. So at the, at the level that you're programming it, you're just telling me, give me fast, normal, or quiet. These are the factors that we apply. Those actually show up in these windows so you can actually see the factors we apply between fast, normal, and quiet. So the A, degree, the A to D integration time box controls the converter used to measure the signal. A short integration time is a relatively fast measurement at the expense of noise. A long integration time results in a relatively low, low noise reading at the expense of speed. So our integration time is based on power line cycles. By the way, there's a really, really good reason for that. This is an international product. It's actually sold everywhere in the world. So if I set an integration time for 16.6 milliseconds, it wouldn't work very good in Japan in the regions where they have 50 hertz line cycle. Okay. So um, what we do is we just tell the instrument what's our line cycle. It's 50 hertz, 60 hertz, could even be 400 hertz in some cases. And it automatically, by talking in PLCs, it automatically adjusts for that. So how, how do you adjust that? How do we know? Yeah, how do you adjust these things? Because I use some of the air products in India, so we have 50 hertz. So, um... It's like 28 something, 281 something. So you have to... 50 hertz, so I don't know how you have 50 hertz. You have to actually go into KCON, the configuration manager, and tell it what the line cycle is. So the power supply in the instrument is auto, auto switching. In other words, it, it can deal with any line cycle, but the instrument itself has to be told what the line cycle is. So, and we, we frequently see that, particularly in India. <laughs> we frequently will see, uh, they forget to set the line cycle from 60 hertz to 50 hertz. And then, you know, they'll send us an email. I've got this much noise and it won't go away. Well, you have to set your line cycle to 50 hertz. Once it's set, it stays set. Yeah. Yeah. Now, most people don't know... That, how do I want to state this? There are a large number of variables in an A to D converter that defines its noise and its resolution. A large number of variables. Most of them are time and some fundamental limits. So you take that and you matrix that with a large number of variables, including different measurement ranges, different cables, different circumstances, and it becomes literally impossible for a non-measurement expert to figure out what's the correct line cycle, the correct A to D converter. So we created what we call the auto mode. 
So our A to D converter is set on auto mode all the time. And we take into account all the factors that we know of and we automatically set our A to D converter to tell you to, to try to get the best measurement based on fast, normal, and quiet. That's another reason to turn on the timestamp because the timestamp will tell you how long it actually takes. Uh, the timestamp actually begins at the beginning of each A to D converter. And so from one A to D conversion to the next is the delta time between measurements. So timestamp is the beginning of the A to D conversion. Okay. And then you can choose custom, which is zero to 10 power line cycles. Okay. So you have pretty good control of the A to D converter. Remember that each source measure unit has its own A to D converter. There's no centralized A to D converter in this instrument. So now we have two modes. We have sweep mode and sampling mode. In sweep mode, remember that we're changing our voltage or current source. So in sweep mode, we have sweep delay and hold time. Sweep delay is the time between each point. Hold time is the time at the beginning of the sweep. But in sampling mode, we have a few more settings here. Now in sampling mode, we're not changing the level of our source. So that's fixed, fixed at 10 volts or whatever. And we're going to take this many samples with this interval between them, and we're not going to start for one second. So in this case, our data will be 250 milliseconds between samples, taking 10 samples with a one second hold at the beginning should be about a 26 se second sweep. Okay. So um, some of you didn't see this morning, one of the first things you do when you set up a test is you choose, am I in sweeping mode or sampling mode? And that defines where you show up in here. You can actually, when you drop in here, you can change from sweeping to sampling mode in here. Unless you have several of your SMUs set up as sweep sources. If your SMUs are set up as sweep sources, we gray out the sampling mode. So you have to go back, convert your test to all fixed level sources, and then you can choose the sampling mode. Sweeping mode applies to any ITM, which one or more forced voltages or currents vary with time. Sweeping mode would be used to increment the drain voltage on a MOSFET, for example. Sampling mode applies to any ITM in which all the forced voltages or currents are static. They don't change. Measurements are made versus time. I sometimes call it a time sweep. Okay. So the sweep delay adds extra time before each measurement. The hold time adds extra time before the beginning of the sweep. So we apply the voltage and then we wait and then we begin sweeping. In sampling mode, the interval is the time between samples. The number of samples um, is the number of samples we take up to 4,096. Now, why are we limited to 4,096? Remember that the SMU has its own microprocessor and, and memory and everything. It runs independent of Windows. So that's how much memory is in the SMU. So the SMU, which very tightly controls its internal timing, you can only sample for 4,096 points. But remember, you can write your own custom user test module. If you chose to write that, you can sample until you fill up the terabyte hard drive. If you're connected to the network, you can go fill up the network drive. You know, you could, uh, you could ship this data out over the internet and probably clog half the world. In fact, our new, uh, our new ultra fast IV has so much, so fast of sampling on it. We take so much data that we can't even begin to manage the data. We actually have a gigabyte of data memory on each A to D converter, and we have four A to D converters on the card. So the thing generates so much data, it's, it becomes almost impossible to analyze it. So here's an example of a, of a, of a sweep. So we initially, the SMUs, when they're in their off condition, are at zero volts or zero amps. 
At the start of the sweep, they will go to the first value, whatever voltage or current that is that you've programmed, and they will wait for hold time. This is that programmable parameter that you have access to. That gives a chance, if this is a really big excursion, it gives a chance to settle. You'll see this a lot on CV, by the way. You'll see a big step on CV, the device won't respond to it, and you'll see a tail on the CV curve. So this hold time is particularly important on a CV test. Then there's sort of this um, uh, internal delay time. This is our default delay, our delay table, times the delay factor, right? Then there's the sweep delay. This is that additional fixed delay that you added in there. And then there's the measurement time. Measurement time is the A to D converter measurement window. So this entire sequence, source delay measure cycle, varies based on the settings you put in. All right, now remember this is a training course, so I'm going into all this detail. The truth is 90% of the time, people pop in, put a test on normal and run it and get great results and walk away, okay? So this is really sort of some advanced kind of stuff. Don't think that you have to actually come in and tweak every one of these parameters every time. Most of the time you ignore it. Put it on normal and run and be happy with it. Question? I see you have a hold line on the in the middle, can you do that again? Ah, okay, so the question is, let me, let me continue with the explanation and I'll answer that. Um, so then the next step of the sweep has a delay, which is the default delay times the factor. It has the source delay and then the measurement time. The next step of the sweep does the delay measure again. Now this particular example is what we call a stepped sweep. So sweep is this SMU sweeping along each of its points. But at the end of the sweep, we have a second source. Usually it's on the gate or the base of the BJT. And that second source is called a stepped source. So what we've done here is the stepped source set to some low value, and then maybe the gate set to a low value, and the drain swept and then the gate went to a new value and the drain sweep starts over again. So it's a new sweep. Even though it's all within one test, it really has to be viewed as nested sweeps where we do a new one step and then a full sweep of an SMU. So what happens is because we've provided some secondary source measure unit uh, has the opportunity to do something big that this source measuring unit doesn't know about, we, we throw the hold time again here. So hold time applies at the beginning of every sweep, even if those sweeps are in a nested loop. What about a dual sweep? Like we go to a, like maybe in a MOS class, we go from in accumulation to inversion, and then you want to sweep back, and I want to wait at inversion for maybe like 30 minutes. Can you program that in using an RPM? Okay, so the, so the question was, um, let's use the example of the MOS capacitor where we sweep from inversion to accum accumulation to inversion, and then I want to sit in inversion for a long period of time and then sweep back again. I think the important criteria to you here is that you don't want the bias to be removed. You want to keep the bias on there because, excuse me, if I, if I let the uh, bias off an inversion, my device will change its characteristic. Something will move in the device, okay? By the way, that, that normally applies more to uh, CV than IV, but the same concept applies to CV or IV. So what you're really talking about here is a hysteresis sweep. Well, I'm gonna sweep one way and sweep the other way. Now, that's a good question. So. The 4200 has built into the ITM, it has built in dual sweep capability. Okay, so, so there's, there's several ways to do it. So the simplest way to do it is to use the built-in dual sweep capability, which sweeps up and sweeps back. The problem is um, the hold time, I believe, applies at the start of the sweep and before it sweeps back. 
So if you wanted 30 minutes up here, you'd get 30 minutes down here and you don't want that. So that probably wouldn't work. A second way to do it is to use the custom list sweep. Right? So with the custom list sweep, I can define every point that I want. Now the problem with custom list sweep is you don't have control of the timing. Each point is a value in a measurement, but you don't have a time per point. So the time you sweep up maybe is a second per point, and then you would have to do 30 minutes worth of points and then sweep back down again. So custom list sweep might be a little cumbersome for that too. However, the way to do that would be, remember the standby con condition button I told you about? That's, that was the button in the timing tab that said, when the instrument gets done, stay at that voltage. Okay, so what you could do is you could, could create a list of two tests. The first test does the sweep, you leave standby conditions on, it stays at that voltage. The next test, um, so then, then the test in between is simply a 30 minute delay timer, and then the next test sweeps it back down the other way. Okay, so now the, the drawback there would be your data would be in two separate files, you would have to manually go and cut and paste that data together if you wanted to see it do both directions. Another way to do that would be to go into the custom user test module, the UTM, and write your own. So you could, it's very easy to write a sweep and then you just put a delay timer on it and write the sweep back down. You could even have it periodically sample up there at that value and have it sweep back down. That's a great example. Thank you for bringing that up. That's a great example and it's actually not uncommon in a MOS device to want to do that. And it's a great example of how a graphical user interface in some cases imposes limitations, you know, that you may need to overcome by having the programming environment. <clears throat> Okay, when we're in sampling mode, we start at our zero condition. By the way, this zero condition is what we call the SMU off condition. Well, remember an SMU is kind of modeled like an operational amplifier. So how do you turn off an operational amplifier? All right? Well, there's lots of ways to do it. Uh, one way is put a relay on the output and open up the relay. But if I do that, I now have this cable floating out there in space. Right? And I don't want to do that. I don't want to have a, a, a cable floating that's not at something I want to put it at. So by default, the 4200 takes the SMU and programs it to zero volts on the, if I remember correctly, the one milliamp range. So that says the SMU is trying to pull that whole cable, that whole system down to zero volts, but it will only pull it down with a maximum of 100 milliamps of, or one milliamp of current. If whatever is out there is trying to force more than a milliamp, the voltage will actually rise. So the SMU is a virtual short circuit when it's in the off condition, right? But, and that's what I show here is starting from an off condition. But remember the SMU might have been left in a standby condition from the previous test. And so we don't always necessarily start from zero, particularly when we're talking about a sequence of tests. So in this case though, in our, in our timing uh, sampling mode, we're starting from zero. We step to our initial bias. We do our hold time, delay, and measure. Interval is that extra amount of time in between samples. Notice that we have a built-in delay and we add the interval on top of that. So the actual time between samples is our internal delay plus the interval. Now if you want to actually control that time more precisely, how would you do that? Well you got to get rid of this delay, right? How do you get rid of that internal delay? That's the delay factor. The delay factor is a multiplier on our internal table. You can set it to zero and effectively shutting off my internal delays. Okay. So now the only delay on here is the interval that you program in precisely. Okay. Also remember that my measurement time is a function of fast, normal, quiet, current range, all kinds of different things. 
So my measurement time is going to vary based on unknown settings out there. So if I want very precise intervals here, I'll set my delay factor to zero. I'll set my, what I have to do is I have to select custom. I don't use fast, normal, quiet. I use custom. Set the delay factor to zero. Set the filter factor to zero turning off my internal filtering factors, and set my power line cycles exactly where I want them. One power line cycle is a, a great setting, 16.6 .6 milliseconds. So now my interval is exactly what I set, 10 milliseconds. My integration time is exactly what I set, 16 milliseconds. I get 26 milliseconds per point. I precisely have control of it, should that be something that's important in whatever it is that I'm doing. So, to sort of recap, because I, I think this is important, there's a lot of information I tossed out here. Keithley came up with this concept of fast, normal, quiet, and it works most of the time. Yeah, leave it on normal, it works most of the time. However, if you dive into the menus, you can come in and you can control everything about the speed and timing of this instrument. Most cases you don't have to, but if you want to, the capability's there. Uh, real briefly, the power, power up sequencing. This is really more important if you're testing more complete circuits. This defines the sequence that the SMUs power up. So, um, in most cases, you really don't care if you're on a standard MOSFET. It doesn't matter if the source comes up or the drain comes up or the gate comes up. But that's what this controls is which SMU will power up first.